Good morning. It's Jeffrey Christian, CPM Group, obviously. Uh, welcome to our third Silver Facts and Fantasies uh, webinar, online seminar. I'm joined today by my colleague and business partner, Carlos Sanchez, and he's going to be watching questions as they come in. And uh, if he sees some really good questions, he, he will interrupt me. Uh, we started these in 2021 for a couple of reasons. Uh, we have for 19 years now had a silver reception at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada each year, starting 19 years ago. Uh, and uh, in conjunction with that, we will produce a little booklet called Silver, uh, which was basically a preview of our Silver Yearbook, which comes out in April or May, uh, usually April. Uh, in 2021, the PDAC uh, did not occur physically uh, because of the COVID lockdown. And uh, so we had a, we said, go do the, the brochure and we will do in lieu of a silver reception an online event. It actually made sense at the time because the silver market had been infested for want of a better word with a lot of promoters who were hawking um issues that just weren't realistic you know let's drain the comex and drive the price higher and 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 the world's running out of mineable silver and the world's running out of refined silver and the price is going to 750 and you'll be able to buy a house with five ounces of silver pretty soon and things like that and we um, were getting a lot of people from the real silver market saying somebody's got to say, hey, this is nonsense. And because a lot of investors are going to lose money. Excuse me one second. A lot of investors are going to lose a lot of money if they buy silver and hold on to it, waiting for $750 or whatever. So we did the silver factor. It was very well received. We did it again last year. Uh, e and even though uh, the PDAC came back live, and we're doing it again this year because it's been very well received. Now, when we announced that we were doing this, we said, here's some of the topics we'd like to talk about. Overview of the current silver market, our projections for 2023 and beyond, factors that affect uh, and determine silver prices, whether there's any truth to some of these common silver myths about draining the COMEX and uh, bank manipulation and metal scarcity, uh, and how these myths got started and who profits from them and why are, why are they so persistent over time? Uh, the explanation of above ground refined inventories and unmined silver, central banks, policies and practices as they relate to silver and the relationship between COMEX prices, uh, inventories and silver prices. Those were all we suggested that we talked about. And I want to touch on one right now. Central banks really don't have silver policies right now. Uh, silver has been demonetized in the United States in the 1960s. In most of the rest of the world in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, and and uh, there are very few central bank or, or treasury silver stocks. Silver is not considered a monetary reserve asset uh, by the international central banking community. Uh, so it's not used as a monetary reserve asset. And central banks really don't have that kind of. But what happened is we said, if you want, you could send in questions ahead of time. And we've gotten about 75 questions so far. And what we did is we consolidated them here. So we're going to do something different this year than we've done last year. These were the areas that the questions uh, came down to. And what we did is we, we merged them and consolidated them. Obviously, a lot of them had to do, what's your price outlook for 2023 or 2026 or in the long run? Um, what's your outlook for the overall market? Questions about the market balances, supply, scrap refining, fabrication demand. How do I invest in silver? How do I store it? And then some stuff that we just sort of lumped into this fantasy. 
So what we've done here is we will go through these questions and you'll see, I can just jump ahead a couple. You know, Silver Outlook, here's some of the questions that, or these are the topics that we had questions. We had multiple questions about each. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to each of these things, we're gonna address some questions and then I have some charts and maybe some tables too in there that, that sort of elaborate on the answers to those questions. So sit tight, it's gonna be a long, I wanted to start with this because this is really what it all comes down to. What is price of silver going to do? And it's, you know, there are questions. What do you expect? Do you think one of the questions that we got was, do you think that the price of silver can rise sharply and stay there? And, you know, my note to myself was just look at the history. The history, and it's a very important issue. The history is that the price of silver can rise sharply, but it's not sustainable at high levels. And high levels are $50 or so. And it's not sustainable for real reasons. So a lot of the questions, as I said, have to do with what's your price expectations at CPM Group do you, for this year and, and for the long run. And it comes down to something that's very important. It's not hard to understand. By the way, 75 questions, all of them were very good questions and substantive questions. Uh, you know, I, I talked to my colleagues and I said, I hate it when I'm watching an interview and, and every question is followed by the first line of the answer. That's a very good question. But these are really good questions, very substantive, indicative of people who were saying, wait a second, let me really understand the real silver market. So the issue ultimately is what is a sustainable silver price? And history has shown prices can spike very high, not only for silver, but for all sorts of assets. Silver can spike very high, but it can't necessarily sustain those high prices. Spikes are caused by market events. My good friend, James Sinclair, who was called himself the original gold bug. He was a proponent of owning gold before the United States allowed individual citizens to own gold. Uh, back in the early 70s, he said, hey, gold could get to $850 an ounce. And when it did in January of 1980, he sold his gold. And his followers thought that was heresy. He said, no, I said I could go. Yeah, um, we projected that palladium could go from $80 an ounce or $100 an ounce to $180 an ounce back in 1986, 87, and then it did. And then it came back up and it was back down to 120 in short order. What are realistic price expectations? We'll talk about that today. What are unrealistic price expectations and what makes the difference? And the difference is several things. One is realistic price expectations are based on reality. What is really going on in the world economically, financially, and politically? What's really going on in society? And what are the fundamentals of silver? Mine production, secondary recovery, fabrication demand, investment demand, any government activities, which as I said, are pretty much gone from the silver market, except buying silver to use in silver bullion coin programs by those countries that have mints that produce coins. And inventories, what's really going on in the physical market? And also the intent and motives of people projecting prices. As I always say, no one pays CPM Group to be bullish or bearish. They pay us to be right on the market. They pay us to give them information and insights that they can use going forward. So when they see price developments, they understand why that might be happening and what comes next. We project sustainable long-term prices. We have annual prices that we look at. And we project those out for gold and silver 10 years. For platinum, we're taking them out to 2050. 
for other metals varying degrees of 10 years or longer. The key to understanding the difference between price spikes and sustainable price projections is in the economics of the silver market. What are the economics of silver mining, scrap recovery, fabrication, domain, jewelry, and silverware? You need to know the macroeconomics. And you know, one of the things that you see, I have a line down here, why are silver promoters wrong? There are a variety of reasons, and a lot of them are, are motives, and some of them are psychological, and some of them are, yeah, you know, they're just trying to promote uh, metal. Uh, but there are people who are convinced, and you'll hear it, and you'll see it on, in comments. Oh, the world's collapsing, the dollar's collapsing, the treasury market's collapsing, the stock market's going to collapse. We're headed toward a gigantic depression. I got that email overnight. You know, oh, wow. Yeah, you look at the guy who said that, and he's been around for what? His entire career. And his entire career has been about 40 years. Yeah. So if you think the world's going to collapse and it or is collapsing and it's not collapsing, then you're going to get your price projection wrong. In terms of prices and sustainability, it comes down to those fundamentals. You see silver at $25 an ounce. Today it's about $21 an ounce. It got up to about $21.20. Uh, as I was looking at it before getting on, it was back down to about 2105. Uh, that's a really good price for a lot of suppliers of metal. It's also a price that is about 25% higher than fabricators were paying four years ago. So fabricators are saying, wait a second, the price is up 25%. You know, it's kind of painful to do this and, and to use silver. Can I cut back? Can I economize on my silver use? There are some investors who say, hey, I bought silver at $5 or $7 or $15, and it's now $21. Got up to $30 for a moment in early 2022. Uh, but yeah, $21, a good profit. I'll take it. So it's the economics of individual supply and demand components that take place, and that is what determines the sustainable price. You see a price spike up to $50, as it did in 1980, for a day. You see the price spike up to $50, as it did in 2011, for a day. People, the economics of silver will change, and the price will come back off. So that's where it is. One other footnote before I go on to the actual presentation. Uh, there were a few questions about what we would recommend in terms of mining stocks. CPM Group doesn't make recommendations about mining stocks, nor do we promote them. Uh, we do research on silver mining companies, which is part of our silver market research. Uh, but we focus on commodities. We are CFTC and NFA registered. We are not registered with the SEC. Uh, we will do things in the stock market under various um, exceptions to the SEC uh, regulations of 1940 and 1934, uh, but we do not publish recommendations on that. We provide our research on silver and other metals to mining companies and since we are often saying, hey, the near-term outlook for the next two years or three years or 10 years is not particularly attractive, uh, we don't want to be in a situation where we're saying don't buy our Korean stock. And we also supply uh, commodities research to mining analysts at banks and brokerage houses, and we don't seek to compete with them. Uh, so we don't do the... So you won't get any stock recommendations from CPM Group today or any other time. So the first set of questions, silver outlook. What's this, what are our projections for silver fabrication demand, industrial demand in 2023? Uh, there were a couple questions about that. Our expectation is that you will see, and I'm going to from time to time put my glasses on because I have our, our balance data here, and I want to be very accurate. Our, our estimate is that we saw fabrication demand 
we include silverware and jewelry in there. Rise about 3% last year, and we're expecting it to rise about 2% this year. Uh, both last year and this year, you saw the demand for jewelry uh, and silver products front loaded into the first quarter of, la uh, of last year. You might see it front loaded into the first quarter or maybe even the first half of this year. Our expectation is that overall the economy will, uh, in many parts of the world, including the United States and Europe, will be stronger in the first half of this year and then will weaken dramatically in the second half of this year. So fabrication demand, the use of silver in industrial products, electronics, solar panels, and everything else, uh, we expect it to rise about 2% all in this year. And uh, that much of the growth will be in the first half and the last half of the year we'll see. Challenges that the silver market base is likely to face. Um, the silver market and the gold market, and one of the reasons I like them, is they're very secretive. And they will, they have always been challenged by questions about how much supply and demand is and who owns it and how the silver market works. That will continue to be perhaps the major challenge. You have a lot of investors, I'll show you some data before, who do not and will not touch silver. And I've seen this my entire career. In the 1980s, we were trying to get institutional investors and high net worth individuals to buy silver because we thought it was a good investment and they wouldn't touch it. Uh, and one of the reasons they said it was, they was well, CPM Group, you guys produce good data. Andy and Harmon uh, Industries produced uh, silver reports back then too, and it was very sparse. It was like a 20 page report once a year, but it was good data, but there's nothing else out there. And we can't really put our clients' money at risk in such an opaque market that is overrun with all kinds of crazy rumors and stuff, too. And in fact, you know, uh, the World Silver Survey that the Silver Institute publishes was created out of CPM Group's research in 1980, and the first report was 1990, with the express purpose of trying to get good data out to silver investors so they felt more comfortable investing. Uh, the Silver Institute came to us in the late 80s and said, why is the silver price falling? It had been $50 briefly in 1980, and it was probably down to about $5 by the time they asked. And we said, because no one's selling silver to investors, banks and brokers are getting out of the business, and investors are not buying as much silver. And in fact, there are a lot of investors who are selling their silver because they bought it at $16 or $20, assuming that the price would go back to 50 and it hasn't. It's gone the other way. 1980, 1981, there are any number of people who were saying that the world was going to collapse, the dollar was going to collapse, and the treasury market was going to collapse, and, and the stock market was going to collapse, and none of that happened. The stock market actually moved from strength to strength, with the exception of a crash. Uh, for about two or three months in October, November of 1987. Uh, the bond market didn't collapse. Inflation was quelled. We entered a period of higher productivity and economic activity. And by the late 1980s, people were saying, what do I need gold and silver for? Um, because uh, we've, we're entering a new economic paradigm. Yeah. And the reason why a lot of banks and brokers got out of the precious metals business in the late 80s was expressly because that was the attitude of their clients. So I think that's the biggest challenge to the world, uh, the silver market base. Do the instabilities in the Indian political system play a role in the global silver market? Absolutely. Uh, India is an enormous silver sink. There are enormous amounts of silver uh, owned by individuals and by temples and by other entities within China, uh, silver, uh, India. And part of the desire to have your wealth stored in silver and in gold within India is based on the instabilities of the Indian political system. 
you know, if you're a lover of democracy, you kind of have to love the bare knuckles politics and democracy of India. Although you wish it were a little bit less bare knuckles and a little bit more rational, but then I guess politics are not rational anywhere. The instability of the Indian political system will continue to keep investors, in Indian investors, interested in silver. And that's very important for the global silver market. If India were to ever enter some political utopia and that instability passed away, which I do not foresee happening in, uh, in the next several decades at least, then you could have a risk of some of that silver coming back into the market. But I don't think that that's an issue. Future interest rate changes obviously will affect gold and silver prices. They affect everything. Our expectation is that interest rates will continue to rise for the next one or two months. The market consensus has shifted, whereas the market consensus was that the interest rates might stop in dis rising in December or January, February of this year. Uh, the market consensus is now that interest rates may rise another 75 basis points between now and June and then plateau. I think that that may be a little bit too bold. Our expectation is that they rise another 25 to 50 basis points in March and then maybe again, you know, 25 basis points in March and maybe another 25 basis points in May, uh, and then they might plateau. And they might plateau after the March, again, depending on what the economic environment is doing. Yeah. And one of the things you have to admit, if you want to be a rational observer of the world, is that the Fed has done a pretty good job of calling economic strength. They were behind the curve on inflation in 2021, but then they got on top of it. And we've seen inflation rates fall now for seven or eight months consistently. They were assuming, and I'll show you some charts later why, that they could raise interest rates substantially without throwing the world into a recession. And you had the silver hawkers out there saying, no, they're going to throw the world into not a recession, but a depression. And it didn't happen. And it hasn't happened. We do think there's going to be a recession probably in 2024, 2025, and we think it's going to be stimulated by things in the real economy, supply constraints, cooling demand for goods and services by consumers and by businesses, and by a constraint in constrained fiscal stimuli uh, compared to where we've been with the hyperactive stimulus uh, on a fiscal policy basis, monetary policy is not going to cause a recession. Fiscal policies and real economic supply and demand changes will. Interest rates will follow their cues from those things, and they will be important to silver and gold prices. Silver is interesting in the green energy transition. And you look at the green energy transition, the first thing you have to realize is it's a whole bunch of industry things. There's electric vehicles, there's solar power, there's wind power. There is the need that we've had for decades to have more stable, smart grids for electricity distribution. There's electricity storage systems. There are different industries. And one of the interesting things is that yeah, electric vehicles are coming along, 10% of light duty. They're coming along, but they won't come along as fast as a lot of people think because of supply constraints on everything from raw materials to components like motors and controllers. Um, wind power is coming along, but it's constrained by this NIMBY thing, like, oh, I don't want turbines in my, my neighborhood. Solar power is coming along as one of the more rapidly emerging ones, and that's where the silver is used. So insofar as the energy transition may be slower than people think, where it's not going to be slower, where it's been faster than people thought it would be, is solar power. And that's where silver's used. And yes, there are continually people looking for things to use instead of silver and solar power. And they will continue to look for that. In 1973-74, the U.S. auto industry came under emission standards. The world saw that coming and in the 1960s a lot of research and the best available technology for cleaning up auto emissions were catalytic converters that used platinum and palladium and rhodium to 
oxidize uh, some hazardous exhausts and reduce other hazardous results throughout things. And prior to the start of the use of PGMs and auto catalysts, the auto industry and the catalyst industry were spending enormous amounts of money looking for alternatives to PGMs. Molybdenum was one that they looked at, but it had to operate at such a high temperature that it would actually cause fires if you parked on the grass and there were leaves on the grass. So you couldn't use molybdenum. The auto industry has spent tens of billions of dollars in the ensuing 50 years looking for alternatives to PGM. And they still use PGMs. And the IEA and CPM group agree in 2050, the auto industry will still be using PGMs to clean up auto exhaust. The solar industry has been looking for substitutes for silver for decades too. Solar industry as a industry producing and selling uh, solar panels has only really been around for about 20, 25 years. But even before that, they were looking for substitutes for silver and they haven't found them. They'll continue to look for them, but silver is probably there. There is an issue, and I was gonna talk about solar power later, there is an issue in that you will see silver pa solar panels recycled at their ends of their useful lives, and the silver will be recovered. But that's another issue. What do you think about the future of gold and silver backed blockchain? I think that it is a bad idea. Uh, people should want to own gold and silver in physical form that has a reduced risk of counterparting misfeasance or malfeasance or failure for any reason. And blockchain is worse than the current system of silver and gold derivatives and other financial asset derivatives in that not only are you open to counterparty failure, which could block you from having access to your gold or silver, but you are with blockchain things, you're not only open to that counterparty risk, but it's risk with people you cannot identify and who have no legal, well, I guess they do have legal issues, but it's very hard to find them. So when investors say, should I be using some sort of blockchain or, or crypto gold or crypto silver, we say, no, you want your gold and silver where you can get to it, and you don't have to worry about counterparty risk. Period. End of the discussion. I'm sorry. Some of our clients are involved in that stuff, uh, but then some of our clients have been involved in other disasters over the past years, too. What is the effect of two different central banks, Mexico and the U.S., to decoupling on silver? Well, the U.S. decoupled on silver in the 60s, so it's over. And Mexico is not necessarily coupling with silver. Uh, there are a couple people in Mexico who, who think that uh, they should have a silver-backed currency, but it's not there. Uh, I don't think that central banks in either of those countries have a major effect on the silver market. And do you think the YouTube PM stacker channels hype will backfire? Well, I think some of it already is, but my view is this. First off, as P.T. Barnum, I think, said, uh, there's a sucker born every minute. And as one of the big pr prominent uh, promoters of silver starting in 2021 told me last year, that's his model. Yeah, doesn't care if so. He doesn't want to know about silver. Doesn't he care what silver supply, demand, and price do. Doesn't care about the people who buy and sell silver based on his uh, pablum. What he cares about is earning uh, sponsorship fees from people who pay him to tout their stocks or at least to be related to them. The reality is this is not a new phenomenon, not a new, it's not an internet-based phenomenon. P.T. Barnum probably got the idea for a circus from looking at the silver market in the 19th century. The silver market has always had Hawkers and, and, and promoters that, that try to get people to buy, buy silver, usually at a too high of a premium. Uh, 
based on inaccurate information. And that's probably going to continue. It's going to happen. It's the nature of the market. Okay, specific issues related to gold and silver. Gold and silver are hybrid assets. They trade like major currencies in U.S. treasuries. They are both quasi-currencies and commodities, silver more than gold. And investment demand is the key factor affecting prices. Investment demand is driven by economic, financial, and political developments more than supply and demand. In silver, supply and demand are important to investors much more than they are it is to gold. They're also highly asymmetrical markets. Gold and silver are highly secretive markets, as I said earlier. This is one of the characteristics that attracts people and entities to these metals. There were people who were saying, well, you know, the banks and brokerage houses, uh, the companies that lend gold and silver to fabricators and miners and refiners and smelters and fabricators that have large amounts of physical metal and consequently hedge that with large chart positions on the COMEX and elsewhere. They should be forced by governments to divulge how much gold and silver they own. I've had that question asked of me in various conferences. I say, you know, transparency is good. Let's start here. How much gold do you own? Well, no, 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 I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the big guy. Well, okay, where's the dividing line between the big guy and the little guy? One of the characteristics that attracts people to gold and silver is the secrecy. Get away with the secret, do away with the secrecy. You will not get rid of gold and silver investing. You will get away with even more opacity in these markets. Because of that, the markets are full of bad data, misinformation, estimated data, poor methodology, and belief based commentary. And that's going to stay, and that's going to be an issue in the gold and silver markets forever. People hold firmly held beliefs on gold and silver. Don't stand up to statistical analysis. Don't stand up to scrutiny. Eric Hoffer, who coined the term true believer in his book, True Believers in the late 40s or early 50s, said, you cannot convince a true believer that his beliefs are invalid based on evidence or things that he sees himself. Because to change your belief based on real world evidence and experience is heresy. A belief by definition should challenge everything that you see in the world. The way it is. Um, I will show you some just there. Silver prices. What's our price outlook for 2023, 2026, and longer? Our price outlook for 2023 is, you know, we saw silver prices, I guess, around 21-something last year. Uh, and we expect about a 6% increase on an annual average price uh, in 2023 to around 2370. Let me just tell you, 2360. Uh, so the price average 2182 last year. And we're looking for 2360 this year, about a 6% increase. We're looking for a bigger increase in 2024, 2025. Now, again, I'm talking annual average prices. What is a sustainable price? Prices can spike much higher. For 2023, we think that the price will probably trade somewhere between 18 or 19 on the low end maybe $28, maybe even $30 by the end of the year, depending on how the political and economic worlds unfold. So we're looking at, let's say, $20 to $28 as a range this year, and an average around 23 We do expect the prices to go higher in 24 25 26 We would not be surprised to see record annual average prices during that period in the area of, say, 40 to $46 an ounce. And that would be a record annual price. The annual price in 2011 was much lower than that. So we do think that is there. But then we think the price falls back. Because, as I said, and I, I have it actually, I think I believe that's what the price of silver does. Not because it's manipulated, 
are suppressed, but because when you see the price over $30, there's a lot of silver that comes into the market, including investors taking profit. And there's a lot of other people who say, I was a buyer at 15. I'm not a buyer at 30 or 40 or 50. The price can spike very high, but it's not sustainable. Three top factors that determine silver prices. Well, investment demand. But investment demand, in turn, is, is um, primarily driven by interest rate changes and uh, comparative market performance. So what's going on in the stock market, the bond market, and currency markets, and gold market? Uh, I think that, you know, if you look at interest rates, comparative market performance, which I'll show you a little bit more later, and, uh, and investment, those flavor investment demand, and investment demand really is what determines the price. Will silver follow gold if gold appreciates? And will a silver ratio decrease going forward? I'll show you a chart on gold-silver ratio in a minute. Silver and gold move in tandem. Oftentimes, silver outperforms gold later in an upward move. And then on the downside as well, silver will tend to outperform gold. Will silver reach $100? If so, in what time frame? I do not foresee it reaching $100. In a spike, it could. Uh, but it can't stay there because of the economics of silver supply and demand. Uh, so since I don't expect it to reach $100, I guess I don't have a time frame to say when I think it will reach that. And consider this, and you know our track record calling silver upper, higher and lower. The people who say silver is going to $100 have been saying that it's going to go to $100 for their entire careers. And so far they've been wrong. And there's that great guy out there who Last year was assuring people that the price of silver would be $750 by the end of 2022. And this year he said in an interview in January that he thinks the silver price could reach $30 this year. The other 720, I guess, was fluff. Uh, the silver price's relationship to the dollar, I'll show it to you in a second. It's very low. Seasonality, I'll show you. This is gold-silver ratio matter. No. We don't really pay attention to the gold silver ratio. We know there are people who trade it. I don't think it's a particularly good trading signal. What it does tell you is the relative strength and attractiveness of gold and silver to each other in the eyes of investors at any given time. And the ratio has ranged between 16 to 1 and 100 to 1 or 120 to 1 over the last 40 years of free gold and silver prices. So. It doesn't seem like it makes sense. Is it true that the market, that when the market goes down as projected, silver will follow? I'm not sure which market that means. Is it true that uh, silver will recover instantly or will it take time? Again, look at the price. Yeah, will it recover right away? Well, there was this dead cat bounce and then it went down and then it came up and then it came down. And then it spent like, what, 20 years before it started rising again? And then it went up and then it came down and it spent about six years or eight years before it started going up again. So no, the price will not recover instantly. That's what history tells you to expect. And I haven't seen anything that, you know, there was a book that came out in like 1990 about the end of history. And I said, you know, it's a crock. <laughs> and it still is a crock. Uh, what causes the intraday price of silver to vary as much as it does? buying and selling by thousands of entities, some of whom go home flat every day. They come in and they buy and they sell and then they get out. And others who are buying either for investment or for, for use, and other people who are selling it because they're producers or refiners. Now, if you compare the silver price volatility to other commodities, what you find is that silver and natural gas are have the the most volatile prices compared to other commodities, but they're not off the charts. Uh, they are understandable. Silver, I think, is more volatile. Natural gas, I'm not quite sure why it's more volatile. Uh, 
Silver, I think, is more volatile because unlike a lot of other commodities, with the exception of gold, maybe platinum and palladium, silver prices trade like currencies and treasuries, and they do that because they have an enormous number of people who treat them as financial instruments, not as industrial commodities. If you look at copper or pork belly or cattle, you find that you have uh, investors in those markets who study those markets and they treat them like industrial or agricultural commodities. Uh, but in silver and in gold, you have an enormous number of additional investors who come in and treat it like a financial asset. So I think that that's where you see the increased volatility. Is there any reasonable probability that calls for way higher prices that might come true? The difference between spikes and sustainable price increases is really what's important. Yeah, we expect prices to spike higher from time to time over the coming decades. And we wouldn't be surprised, depending on what happens in the economy and political world, we wouldn't be surprised to see a spike in the next four years. We don't see it being particularly sustainable. We see prices being way higher as we define that by saying that, yeah, the price could rise to an average price of $40 or maybe a little bit higher. Uh, that's way higher. The idea of $100 on a sustained basis or something beyond that, $1,500 that one guy talks about, there's very little probability that that will ever come true. Topic everyone is always saying, silver is the most undervalued asset and it has. How's it always going to shoot to the moon? Well, first off, not everyone says that it's the most undervalued asset. CPM Group certainly doesn't uh, say that. I think education is the most undervalued asset. And why does the SLV not move at the uh, same time or in equivalent steps to the silver coin? I think the reason is because People who invest in silver ETFs are a subset of silver investors. And silver COMEX has a different subset of investors. There are investors who don't participate in either market because they want physical metal as a long-term investment. There are investors who don't want physical metal who will trade the COMEX. And as I said, a lot of them will go home flat every day they come in, they say, let me look at the silver price altogether today. I'm going to buy. Tomorrow I might be a seller in the opening. And by the end of the day, I'm going to either cut my losses or take my profit. Uh, the COMEX is a place where you see a thousands, if not tens of thousands, of those kinds of participants market. The ETFs, so the, like the SLV, are sort of halfway between them and the long-term investor. They don't necessarily want the highly leveraged, very short-term exposure to silver price changes that COMEX investors want, but they also don't necessarily want to take physical metal, store it, and worry about how to store it and where to have it, and is it safe, or, you know, is that guy really actually act, uh, honest? Uh, so they invest in uh, the SLV, and I think that's the difference that you see in the price. The arbitrage opportunity between COMEX and SLV and physical metal. Keep the prices relatively close to each other, but you'll see variances because of different populations involved in different markets. I've shown you this price we can go on. Silver seasonality, February typically is the strongest silver price, January and February, and then it starts declining in March, April, May, and it falls off a cliff in June and July. Starts to recover a little bit into August and September, comes off a little bit. That's the seasonality. Our view is that this year we've probably seen uh, the high for the next several months. We expect not only seasonality, but economic factors to cause investors to sort of quell their interest in silver. We wouldn't be surprised to see the silver price start rising in the fourth quarter, overriding the seasonal pa price pattern based on our expectation that economic and political developments may stimulate increased investment demand in the fourth quarter of this year. 
I'm yeah. silver, real, and inflation-adjusted prices. Looking at it using 2021 prices as the base, real silver prices in 1980 spiked as high as $90. On an annual average basis, the nominal price of silver averaged about $21 in 1980. But adjusted for inflation, the equivalent 2021 price would have been $90, far higher than what you saw in 2011. In 2011, the average price that year was about $34 an ounce. On an inflation-adjusted basis, that was almost 50. But it was significantly lower than the inflation-adjusted price in, in 1980. And these are annual average prices. The ratio, the relationship, you look at nominal, you look at inflation adjusted prices and the price has varied, you know, since 1960, well, 1960s and 70s. And there's a different silver market by far then. But if you look at the 1990s and early 80s, you saw it less than $10 in 2021 dollar terms. And then it's 90 on the high side. So you can, you can see like a, a, a ratio between the low and the high, a tenfold. Not particularly a good store of value. It's a good place to make money. Gold silver ratio, as I said, we don't pay attention to it, uh, but it, other people do. Uh, we do think that the gold silver ratio probably will come down at some point over the next few years. We don't see it going back to 40 to 1 necessarily, or even, uh, or definitely not 16. By the way, the day that it hit 16 to 1 was the day that the Hunt brothers went bankrupt. Silver's long term statistical correlation with the US CPI is very low. I'm not quite sure where it is, but it's probably less than 10%. Consumer, you can see the US CPI very high in the 70s. And silver, which was one of the few ways that you could hedge your inflation exposure back then, did very well. It rose in 73, 74, then it rose in 79, 80, then it came down. But look at that long period of time after inflation came down, when silver was basically flatlining. And then the important part is 2005 onward, you saw silver prices rise very sharply as inflation continued to be relatively uneventful, trading below 4% and spiking down during the Great Recession uh, and, and uh, global financial crisis. Inflation then picked up, but again, it tended to be mostly between below 2 2.5%, two and, and silver prices did come down. And they both started to rise in 2020, 2020, really 2021. Dollar, you hear about the dollar collapsing? This is the price of, this is the trade weighted dollar. And you can see, yes, it rose very sharply from early 2021 all the way into October of 2022. And it has fallen January, February, or November, December, January. And it's kind of trending sideways. So the dollar is not ready to collapse. And it's very interesting because if you looked at the Russian Central Bank's data, uh, they still have about a third of their trade in U.S. dollars. Okay. Yes, they are trying to diversify into other currencies for trade settlement purposes. And yes, the Chinese yuan has gone from like virtually nothing, maybe 2%, up to about 8% of their transactions. The dollar, because of the liquidity in the dollar globally compared to other currencies, the dollar will someday ceased to be the reserve, de, de facto reserve currency. Uh, but that someday is decades away because you can't make that transition fast. And this is the chart showing you the silver price versus the dollar. Dollar rises and falls. And then silver rises and falls. Sometimes a lower dollar will affect the silver price. Sometimes what is happening is that the dollar is falling and silver prices are rising because they're both reacting to a separate set of independent variables. That's what happened in 2008-2011. I have some other ones that I wanted to look at. 
show you silver bonds, silver versus treasury bonds. Again, not a good correlation, which is actually good for an investor because you're looking for uncorrelated assets. Again, these are real interest rates. Obviously, negative real interest rates are good for a hard asset like gold and silver because the opportunity cost of not earning interest is gone uh, or uh, yeah, is gone and and you you have other economic factors there. This is a scatter plot. I'm sorry, this is gold, not silver, but this is a scatter plot of changes in the real gold price and changes in real interest rates, treasuries. And you can see the, the correlation is negative 16%. You can see from the scatter plot, it's all over the board. There are times when interest rates and precious metals prices are rising together, and there are times when they're falling together, and there's times when they're moving in opposite directions, and there's times when there's just simply no correlation between them. And the same is true for silver, but I don't have a chart on that. Now, Fed funds rates, they've risen sharply since the beginning of 2022. And they didn't throw the world into a recession, partly because even though they've risen sharply and they're now like 4.8% for short rates, these are Fed funds rates. They're lower than they were for most of the period of time from the 1960s through 2008. And the Fed knew that. The Fed knows that. And the Fed knew that it could substantially raise interest rates, try to combat some of the cyclical and post-lockdown issues that were pushing in inflation higher. And they could raise interest rates 4.5%, not throw the world into a recession, because even at 4.5% increase in the course of one year, the total increase would take nominal rates back to the low end of what you've seen over the last 60 years. So yeah, interest rates might rise a little bit more, but they're not going to be back where we saw in the 70s, 80s, 90s, oddies. Silver fundamentals, what are they? What do they mean to price? Well, I've already talked about it. Let's talk about silver surpluses and deficits and what are the next three years projections. If silver prices deficit, then must the silver, the price appreciate? Okay, no. And in fact, the correlation between silver prices and market balances in silver, if you measure and report the silver market balance accurately, is that silver prices rise when the market is in a surplus. Deficits represent times when fabricating, first off, Get your nomenclature. Basic economic research in commodities is a market balance is total supply, mine production and scrap in the case of a metal, less fabrication demand. You do not throw in investment demand with fabrication demand. You do not use outrageously high, unrealistic numbers for investment demand so that you can say, oh, the market is in a deficit. If you take out investment demand and you use realistic investment demand figures, what you find is that the market has been in a surplus since 2006, and that has correlated with rising prices. And that will continue to be the case. When you see deficits in the market, that means that fabricators want more silver than the mines and the refiners can supply. And they then have to turn to investors to get that silver out of refined inventories. So deficits are drawdowns in inventories. Most of those inventories are held by investors. There are large inventories that are held by uh, commercial entities, banks that lease the metal out to the industry, but that metal's bespoke. It's being used in industry and there's a flow in and out of it on a daily basis. It's really the investors who have the more, what some people would call sterile inventories, and they will sell the metal to meet that fabrication demand. 
fabrication demand will be stronger because the price will be lower because the investors are disenchanted. That's what we saw from 1990 through 2005. So deficits don't mean higher prices. Surpluses correspond with higher prices, but you've got to get your data right and you've got to get your methodology right. If you're an economist studying the silver market, you're going to use that definition I gave you, total supply, less fabrication demand. If you're trying to convince people that they should buy silver and hold it off the market, then you're going to throw in investment demand. You're going to have a more bullish situation that you can present to them. Say, oh my God, the silver market's been in a deficit and in the deficit's growing. You better buy your silver now because the price is going to $100. That's not where we are. Supply. A lot of questions about line production. What's true production? I'll show you in a second. Production costs. I don't think I pulled them in here. Uh, silver mine production. Is silver mine production double counted? Sometimes. At least in the past. Uh, jurisdictional risk is a better mine in Mexico or British Columbia. I'll show you the mine production figures in a second, as well as secondary recovery. Uh, production costs. 80% of the production comes from byproduct, gold, copper, lead and zinc company, uh, mines. And so the production costs are like a couple dollars an ounce. What it costs really to refine the metal from tank house slimes after you've recovered all the other metals that are in there. 20% um, comes from primary silver mines and the average cost, I believe is probably around $8 on a cash operating basis. On an all in sustaining basis, the cat uh, the cost is probably closer to 12 to $14. So mining companies ought to be making good profits on an operating basis, right? now. Some of that stuff disappears, paying down debt or whatever. Uh, but, you know, the costs of producing silver are far below current prices and recent prices. Um, so that's where it is. Some mine production is double counted. So you'll see people who will count production at the mine, say in Peru or Bolivia or Mexico, uh, and they'll say, okay, mine production in Mexico, Peru, Bolivia was X. And then they'll also count it where it's ultimately smelted and refined. And we saw this problem in the early audits um, when there was a change in regulations related to how you could handle your byproduct gold and silver in China from base metals concentrates. And and you saw a lot of silver coming out of China for a while uh, that was actually silver that was refined uh, from imported concent uh, base metals concentrates, primarily copper, but also lead and zinc uh, concentrates. The smelters in China wanted copper, lead, and zinc. Uh, they would import the concentrates, refine it, keep the copper, lead, and zinc, and then sell the silver. And about a billion ounces came out over eight years, uh, which was double counted because people thought that it was central bank selling. Because the central bank was selling it for the smelters, they assumed that that was inventories that the central bank had held uh, for a long time. Um, Jeff, uh, it's yes. Carlos. Uh, we have a question related to mine supplies. Is okay. how like Okay. How likely is it that a country will nationalize, nationalize a silver mine and how would this affect the stock price of a miner in that jurisdiction and how would this affect the price of silver? A country or is it a specific country they're asking about? No specific country, a no. country in general. That's the jurisdictional risks to mining. And yeah, there are real jurisdiction risks to mining. There is an increased in resource nationalism around the country, uh, around the world. Uh, and it's a real risk that you have to put into. And it's also the issue in Mexico. Um, our view is that nationalizing mines is not the smart way to go. If you want to be a resource nationalist, you should let other people bear the brunt of mining tax them. Uh, you know, why would you put in all the capital and why would you build up all the expertise needed to run a mine profitably just to increase the taxes? And that actually is what's happened in Mexico and a number of other countries. Obviously, outright nationalization like we saw in the 60s, and we see it from time to time in various countries uh, 
in recent years in Central America, we've seen a couple uh, situations. We've seen threats of nationalization in parts of Africa and certain African countries. That's obviously uh, very detrimental to capital formation and foreign direct investment in that country. And it tends to coincide with or, or lead to falling production. And it is a real risk. It's one of many risks, operational risks that you in, uh, face if you invest in a mining company rather than a physical metal outright. Uh, but it is definitely a real problem. In terms of Mexico versus uh, Northern BC, um, I think they're both attractive jurisdictions. Mexico obviously has some governmental risks. It has some security risks, uh, but it has enormous, very rich reserves. Um, I would not be surprised to see some very rich reserves showing up in the Northern BC and in the Yukon because it's to some extent the same geologic uh, trend that you see from Bolivia and Peru through Mexico. I think they're both interesting places. I'm not quite sure which is the better uh, jurisdictional uh, risk to take at this point. Um, relationship between silver and base metal supplies. It's funny because, uh, yeah, the silver mine production actually has a closer correlation statistically with copper prices than it does with silver prices. Reserves and resources, I'll show you some stuff in a second. And then I'm going to go into some above ground uh, inventories. Uh, and in, 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 in ground inventories. Mine production, you can see, you know, it went from 300 to about 800 million ounces between the late 1970s and, and early 1980s. Uh, it then came down for a while. It dropped sharply in 2020. I actually are showing you our projections through 2030. Uh, because there are people who are talking about a sharp drop-off in silver mine production. We see about an 8% decline over the next decade. That's not exactly a sharp uh, decline. Oh, let me be a little bit clearer. We see about an 8% decline over the next five years, and then it kind of plateaus in our view. Uh, and that relates to our expectation of higher silver prices over the next four years, uh, helping mine production. Secondary supply is also diminishing somewhat. Total, but but total supply is probably expected to be about four percent off over the next decade. The world's not running out of silver. Mineable reserves have never been larger than they are now. There's 16 billion ounces. I'll show you in a second. Reserves are larger than resources many times over. Reserve resources, I mean or larger than reserves many times over. The resources get converted to reserves in various ways. One is a higher price. And as the price rises, things that are sub-economic resources become economically mineable reserves. In addition to that, companies explore and they delineate resources and they say, okay, I no longer have inferred resources. I now have measured or inferred reserves, so it converts. Total reserves are not declining, they're rising. Many high-grade enormous deposits are being discovered or being further delineated. Some of them have been known for 100 years. Some of them have been known for 500 years, but they've never really been drilled out as extensively as they could or should be. Not all of them are publicly uh, reported yet, but there's a lot of silver on the horizon in mineable reserves. On a above ground basis, you've got about five and a half billion ounces of silver in refined form coins and bars. And that doesn't include about 26 billion ounces that are in jewelry, silver, decorative items, and religious objects. A steady stream of which gets refined into bullion every year. Just a small amount of it, but some of it, less, less than 1%. Less than 1% of that stuff trickles into the market, gets refined. Uh, yeah, I have a beautiful statue of a Hindu god that was given to me uh, for making a speech in Mumbai a decade ago. It's exactly 10 ounces of sterling silver. It's a religious object. It's also an investment product. 
And there's a lot of those statues in India. So we're not running out of it. I showed this chart in a video a couple of weeks ago, and it was very funny. I said, look, 1981, we had 8 billion ounces of reserves that were delineated or inferred. And we were producing about, well, let's go back there and look at that. We were producing about 300 million ounces a year. So people would divide that 8 billion and say, oh my God, you know, 20 some odd years, we're going to run out of reserves. Between 1981 and 2020, we mined 26 billion ounces of silver, more than three times what we had in reserves. We did not run out of reserve. In fact, at the end of that period, we had 16 billion ounces of proven reserves, proven and probable reserves. So, 16 plus 26, you know, do the math, it's 42 million, billion, billion ounces. Now, when I did this, somebody said, oh my God, we're, we're, we're mining uh, a billion ounces of silver a year. Well, it's actually about 800. But let's say it's a billion ounces. By 2040, we're going to be out of reserves. No, no, no. Those reserves are continually replenished. And typically, at the end of each year, there are more known, proven, and probable reserves than there were at the start of the year. So if you fast forward to 2040, you're not going to see zero reserves. You're probably going to see something north of 26, right? north of 16 billion ounces, even though we will have mined 16 billion ounces or so of silver in that period of time. There are plenty of reserves, and there are a lot of resources behind that that are not quantified yet because there's just resources. And then above ground, 5.5 billion ounces. We got there before, and it's very important to understand, we got there before 19, late 1980s. But go back to 1980, we had 4.5 billion ounces of silver, mostly in secret, unreported inventories held by investors around the world standard part in India, but the price of silver went from $5 to $50. Inventories at risk, rest do not affect the price. Inventories in motion can drive the price higher or lower. Investors started buying silver when the price got to $50, and they kept buying until the price got back down to $5 in 1990, at which point they became net sellers of that metal. In the meantime, CPM group, well, us, yeah, we weren't entirely CPM group at that time. Um, we helped create the Silver Eagle in the mid-80s and the Silver Maple Leaf in the mid-80s and Silver Coins had a couple other mints too. And you started seeing investors say, no, oh, Silver Bullion Coins, official transactions, tax breaks, tax advantages in some places, and they're smaller and they're more useful than a thousand ounce bar. And they also uh, are, are competitive with hundred ounce bars and 10 ounce bars and things like that. And so you start seeing people buy more and more coins. And as the price of silver rose after 2005, they started converting their thousand ounce bars into coins. And they also started moving silver into ETFs. Uh, for the convenience uh, sake and the buying and selling basis, there are uh, you know there are about two billion ounces of silver remaining in bullion bar form from what we can estimate. Uh, perhaps half of that is actually owned by banks. So all those banks that you think or have massive naked short positions actually have hedged long positions in the physical metal. The naked shorts that these guys tell you are going to blow up in their face, but they don't, are hedges of their physical metal. And that physical metal isn't lying sterile. Right? You look at a bank that has a vault in New York City, and in that vault, people store silver. And then there are people who know so little about the silver market that they say, oh, that bank owns that much silver. No, that bank owns a depository 
and it charges people to store silver there. Its silver money is many times larger than what other people are storing at its vault. And a bank knows that silver at rest is not earning money. So the bank will lend its physical silver to a mining company or a smelter or a refiner or a jewelry manufacturer or an electronics company or a component manufacturer or, or a metals converter or a metals plating company or people who use them as collateral for investment products. And they will charge them. And they'll charge them 3% or so for that silver. <clears throat> So there's a lot of silver out there, maybe a billion ounces of it owned by banks. They're not naked, short. They hedge that because they don't want to have price exposure. They want to earn interest on their metal that they're lending out to people. And if the price goes from $15 in 2018, 2019 to $21 in 2022, they're earning 3% on $22 not 3% on $15. So you're not going to bankrupt that bank by driving the price of silver higher. You're going to give them record profit. And you may have noticed that some of the major banks that in, are involved in gold and silver trading have been reporting major record profits in their gold and silver trading last year and early uh, coming into this year. But if you don't know that, you might think that you could squeeze the market and drain the COMEX and drive the silver price higher. Yeah. There is an institutional shift from mining to metals, and there are several reasons for that. And unfortunately, yeah, some of the reasons are not that people have woken up and said, hey, wow, let me invest in metals. <laughs> it's more that there are structural changes on the buy side of the institutional investment management industry that are leading shifts away from individual companies and smaller cap companies like most mining companies are. And they're focusing on indexed funds and ETFs instead. So you have kind of a, a break between the capital formation that stock markets traditionally provided individual companies and investing in the stock market. Uh -oh. And this has been going on for decades and it's going to continue. I like this point out that in his preface to the second edition of Das Kapital in the 1980s, shortly before he died, Karl Marx said, hey, I was wrong about the transition of capitalism to communism. And the transition is going to come when capital realizes that labor is just a nuisance. And capital discovers a way to make more capital out of capital without involving labor sort of like the stock market today. But, you know, he, he, he was a socialist. <laughs> he wrote his book and he called it capital. He didn't call it socialism. But I think most people in the United States haven't read it. Focus on index funds and ETFs is distracting capital away from the mining industry. Computer-based investment funds are outperforming stock pickers on the long run. It's causing major issues, not only for the mining industry, but for capital formation with small cap companies. The mining industry has its own issues, which add to this. It has relatively poor performance historically. There are those nationalism and, and jurisdictional risks that we were talking about a few minutes ago. There is an investment security issue, and there are ESG issues. And you put all that together, and a lot of investors are saying, I just, you know, it's easier to invest in metals indexes and metals ETFs. This is the mining shares, poor performance relative to capital. They did poor title here. This is the risk reward profile of mining the FT mining index. And you can see that as you increase your proportion of your portfolio from, away from stocks and T-bills or T-bonds, if it's the blue, adding the FT mining index, you increase your risk and you increase your potential return. 
risk being the volatility of your portfolio. And you're increasing your risk greater than you are increasing your return. So you're taking on more risk and you're lower uh, and, and while you're increasing the potential return of your portfolio, you're not increasing it proportionately to the risk, increased risk that you're taking. Remember this because I'll show you a similar chart in a few minutes on silver investments, physical silver, silver fundamentals, fabrication demand. What's the relevance of silver in electric future of homes and autos? Silver will be used and increased increasingly in electricity uh, systems, electrical systems, uh, and electronic systems. In the auto industry, you have seen, uh, well, I'll show you a chart in a second. You've seen strong growth in non-electric Electric vehicles will use one and a half to two times as much silver as conventional petroleum-fueled uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, it, it's not like 8% or eight times or 10 times the way some promoters say, uh, but it, it, it is adding to it. And in so far as you have about 10% of the light-duty vehicles now being electric vehicles, you are seeing increased use of silver in auto. And in homes, you're seeing the same thing. It's home appliances, it's home electrical systems, it's smart electrical systems. It's all over them. And I'll show you, I don't have a uh, price. Uh, I don't have our projections here because that's what we sell. Total fabrication demand, a little bit spooky to me because it's been relatively flat for the last quarter of a century. You've seen big shifts in who's using the silver and how they're using it. And some of those shifts are masked here. Photographic use of silver, which used to be the largest use, gone away. It's still there, about 40 million, 45 million ounces. Silverware, jewelry, which is really all kinds of things because some of that's quasi-investment and some of it is high uh, markup jewelry, uh, fashion jewelry. Uh, it's still pretty important, although there are signs that it's diminishing. Electronics is growing, as I just said, but within the electronics industry, the applications that use silver are changing, and we throw batteries in with electronics here. Other uses continue to grow, and then that top thing is uh, photovoltaics. You know, 10, 20 years ago, they were not really using virtually any silver, uh, but now they're using about 120 million. Show you a chart. Here's the solar panels. Our estimate is that they used about 119 million ounces last year. That was up from about 100 million ounces in 2021. It continues to grow. Our expectation, it'll be about 132, 134 million ounces this year. It will continue to grow. I don't have our projections here, um, but it is a major growth industry that, uh, will continue to be. And then silver use in auto electronics, which is a subset of that electronics. And again, major growth from 2009 to 2018, that's not electric vehicles. That's electronics in vehicles that burn petrol or diesel uh, as their fuel. Came down, there are people who are talking about 2018, 2017 being peak auto that we'll never make as many automobiles as we did back then in the future. That's not CPM. We have our auto projections running out to 2050 because we do high period manganese research and platinum group metals research and other research. And next week at the PDAC, I'll be giving a speech on the energy transition and its importance to uh, metals. And then I will give a similar speech at the Society of Mining Engineers Conference in here in New York in April or May. I think it's in May. Uh, so it's going to be important. Uh, and you are seeing electric vehicles take market share and, and grow their market. It won't be as fast as a lot of people think. Uh, and it will uh, increase the amount of silver used in auto electronics. But in the meantime, you're seeing uh, increased demand for silver in other electronic applications in homes and in factories and in businesses. Investing in silver begins with a good part, and it's only been an hour and a half. 
storage recommendations for large investors. Um, it depends on who you are, what your objectives are, how much metal you have. You know, we like to focus on reputable invest uh, depositories and, and, and brokerage houses that we can trust. It's very funny because we have been approached recently by uh, an investor who has bought a lot of gold and silver and he's storing it at a refinery that we don't know. So we're a little bit nervous about it. And I was thinking about it and I was thinking about this. There's a fellow, Craig Ryan, who ran Ryan Precious Metals in Seattle. And he was a very religious man. He actually wrote a book on how Jesus wants you to teach your children to manage your finances, their finances wisely. Um, and then he ran off with all of his clients, metal and his secretary. But he only ran off to Hawaii. So he was like Australian bro. Now, I was trying to remember his name, and I looked up another guy. And I said, no, 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 that guy was also very religious, but he was a good guy. And I looked him up because I hadn't done any work with him for several years. And it turns out he's actually in jail for basically doing the same thing, converting what was his business. Uh, and he had a lot of people who belonged to his same religious uh, group who trusted him because he was a very religious man. Um, and it was basically a Ponzi scheme. So he's in jail too, or he was in jail for a while at least. Um, it's very difficult to to make sure that you have a reputable person. You're seeing this in the ETF market. If you look at total gold ETF holdings, they've been down over the last year or so. But if you look at the top five, they're actually growing their assets, especially in the GLD. And what you're seeing is investors saying, I still want to own gold. Still want to own it via ETF, but I want to be in the largest, most respected, most liquid e ETF run by a reputable bank. Even though there's that guy on the internet who says they're going bankrupt, they're not. Uh, and I don't necessarily want to hold my gold in a small ETF that's run by a regional bank that, yeah, I don't know. So there's a very big issue about your counterparty risk, even when you own physical metal, depending on where you own it, what the insurance program is, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, there, we told a story about a, a nice lady who husband passed away in the 1980s and someone convinced her that she should buy $50 million silver and, and uh, further convinced her that she should buy $50 million worth of silver in silver coins. And we explained to her that she didn't need that many coins. She might want to buy a hundred or two hundred or maybe even a thousand silver coins, um, uh, which at the time would have been about five thousand um, dollars, and put the rest in thousand ounce bars that are readily resaleable in a recognized internationally recognized depository so that it could be sold on a moment's notice. And that comes down to the next question, which is premiums, et cetera. And, and um, you have to pay attention to what you're going, it's going to cost you to sell your metal, depending on where you store it. So give me a call. Love to catch up with you. Speak about philosophy. There's a very interesting uh, series of philosophical YouTube videos that I've been following that you might be interested in. Um, we can talk about it. three nines versus four nines. Investors sh should want three nines. They want good delivery metal stored in depositories that are recognized uh, by the industry as being reputable, where you can swap the stuff out. You can locate, do location swaps relatively cheaply. You can sell it and you don't have to worry about getting hit with questions and assay charges and things like that. It does factor into your long-term investment strategy because if you're buying silver and storing it and paying storage charges, those storage charges add up over time. You can buy it and if you are large enough, uh, you can lease it to somebody in that depository. But you have to be very careful about that because that you're taking on a counterparty. For 2023, should investors 
own physical or digital silver ETFs. First off, ETFs are not digital silver. Most ETFs, that, well, the ones that we follow, there are ETFs that, that invest in futures and options. But if you look at our precious metals advisory report, we have a list of, I don't know how many, 20 silver ETFs. And those are ETFs that buy physical silver, store it in, in reputable depositories for the most part, uh, have annual audits that are available to the investor. Digital silver is something different. Avoid digital silver at all costs. You want physical silver, and some of it you might want in your own possession, but the rest of it you want stored where you know you can get it, and it's a reputable place. Not just that you know you can get it, you can sell it too without incurring transportation costs, assay fees, out charges, and other issues. Be surprised what you get hit with when it comes time to sell your metal if you don't have it stored properly. What do we project will be the best time this year to buy silver? Probably June, July, August. Uh, we do think that the price could be strengthening by the end of the year. Uh, what might I do if I bought silver at much higher prices after listening to marketers many years ago? Cry into your beer? Uh, no, I'm not quite sure. Uh, we will sometimes, well, first off, we, we advise clients that are in that situation. Understand you, you have a loss. Yeah. Be honest with yourself. You made a mistake when you were a kid. Shouldn't have bought that motorcycle. You've got a loss and you may just live with it. You can try to trade options or futures and try to generate profit that offset those losses over time. If you own the metal, you can lease it out and earn some profits that way too, if it's a substantial enough. But the reality is that it's water under the bridge and you may have a loss that you, it's just gone, it, 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 it's gone. Uh, you can try to be a more intelligent and more astute investor you have to be very careful that you don't become too aggressive not only investors but major groups Hamanaka at Sumitomo uh, the fellow at Kodelko uh, there are a number of cases with large hedgers who got it wrong and they became they tried to recoup their losses by trading much more aggressively and what they did is they compounded their losses so if you're going to try to offset previous losses with more aggressive and intelligent uh, investing strategies, short and long-term ones, you have to be very careful that, you, that you've learned your lessons well and uh, that you avoid compounding the losses with more aggressive trades. Which matters more to price, investment demand or fabrication demand? Investment demand. My opinion of the PSLV, I don't give opinions on individual companies in public, but I will say this, avoid closed-end funds. Closed-end funds, I just don't understand why people do that. Junk U.S. silver coin, good investment? Yes, but there are better ones. Bullion coins are better. It's always best to get as close to the market standard as possible to avoid those losses and discounted sale. Yeah, if I want to own silver, I want to own silver. And bullion coins or bars are silver. Junk silver coins, yeah, they're silver, but they are open to vagaries in a very small, obscure market. Most of those coins have gone away. Um, own silver. Relative attractiveness, the silver versus platinum as an investment in 2023 and beyond. We think that silver and platinum both have bright futures and they have the potential for prices to rise and rise sharply for brief periods of time over the next 10, 20 years. I think silver might make sense. Silver might see a price increase faster and further and sooner than platinum. 
we do think that platinum prices are starting to break out of the 800 to a thousand dollar range that they were in from 2014 through 2020 uh but we think that for the next couple of years that may be a relatively slow move uh, for fundamental reasons within the platinum industry. Also, if we do see a recession in 2024, 2025, the auto industry, which is, is the largest user of platinum, may see weakening uh, demand for platinum. You're also seeing a shift away from petroleum fuel powered vehicles to electric vehicles, which is eating into the market for PGMs and auto catalysts. That said, you're seeing South African production likely to fall over the next three to five years, uh, and and you could see a tightening platinum market, which could see higher prices. But silver, I think you might see a bigger move sooner. So in terms of it all, for 2023 and beyond, you know, I might be if I if I had to make that decision, I might say I'm going to invest in silver now, but I'm going to look to swap out and take profit if silver prices rise and platinum prices haven't risen commensurately, and depending on what the fundamentals and the economic environment are at the time. I might sell my silver and buy platinum at some point. Uh, what's the most liquid and high purity coins purchase? Well, Maple Leafs and, uh, and U.S. Eagles, I believe, are the most liquid and 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 best uh, uh, recommended. Most liquid and well recognized silver bars to buy. If you're buying thousand ounce bars, you want to buy good delivery bars that are stored in a recognized registered depository. If you're buying smaller bars, I really don't know what names to say. Uh, and I probably wouldn't want to say them in public anyway. Uh, but, you know, reputable names. You know, if you're looking at a name that is recognized around the world as a refiner, that's good. If you're looking at a refinery, uh, a bar that has a name on it that says that, you know, and you ask around and, and people in the business don't know, yeah, I never heard of that guy. I've heard of them, but I don't know them. It's probably bad. Also, I saw a video a few weeks ago that really spoke to me because a guy had a 10-ounce silver bar, and it had this label on it that said this was a LBMA uh, good delivery bar. And LBMA bars are 1,000-ounce bars, plus or minus whatever, 5%. LBMA recognized bars are not 10-ounce bars. They may be refined by a refinery. They may be manufactured by a refinery that is an LBMA-recognized refiner, but they are not LBMA-recognized bars. And you see something like that, and they guess all oh, well, it's just like, you know, semantic error. Yeah, well, you shouldn't be making semantic errors if you're selling precious metals to people. We're all kind of paranoid about that. Uh, what are the most reasonable premiums and discounts for both? Shop around. Uh, we have companies that we work with that give our clients really good pricing, and we're very happy with them. Uh, and we see other companies that are offering much less attractive things. One of the things to watch for is when they say, this is X percent over spot. What spot price? Oftentimes, it's not the spot New York price or the spot London price. It's that broker's or dealer's spot price. So silver's $21 uh, on Comax. It's $21 in London. And the dealer says, I'll sell you this silver bar at 2% over my spot, over spot. Say, what spot? And they say, oh, it's 22. It's like, okay, that's... Not spot, it's your spot. So you have to pay attention to stuff like that. And then again, if people are doing tricks like that, you don't want to do business with them. Life's too short, money's too scarce. What are the best company equity proxies? We don't talk about equities. What is the demand shape of various form, physical forms of silver? I'm not quite sure what demand shape means. Do investors have a preference for national mint bullion versus refined bars? It depends on the investors. Again, if you're a small investor or if you if you want small investments, you want national mint official national mint bullion coins. If you are a larger investor or you want to store metal, you want thousand ounce bars that are good delivery, that are in 
registered good delivery depositories. I have both, and most of my clients have both. You'll have some coins, and you'll have some bars. Uh, that's probably what you know how it is. This is that optimal roll of silver. You can see it's a much steeper thing, but the key is that if you look at say ten percent, you're you've got a risk of six percent, and you've got a return of seven point three percent. And you can go all the way up to 25, 30%. And at 25%, if you're using T bills in your model portfolio, you've got a risk of a little over 7%, and you have a, a return of a little over 7.5%. So you're increasing your return more than you're increasing your risk. Once you go beyond that, then you're increasing your risk more than your return, and you're counterproductive. And yet, Silver represents less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of global financial wealth. Most investors don't invest in silver. This thing you can't read. This is a quilt of investment, and it's 11 investments. We've added gold and silver in here, and we kind of highlighted them a little bit, but I'll break them out. And you can see, you know, gold, silver, gold, silver, gold, silver, Six of the years between 2001 and 2021, gold or silver was the top return. And this is return measured from the, 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 the end of the previous year to the start of the previous year. I've got, this was 2022. Cash was king, 4.4% 4 4 return. That's T-bills. Silver was at 3% return in that the price appreciated 3% from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Gold was relatively flat, is 0.13%. On an annual average basis, it rose more than that. It was at a record level. Everything else, I yield bonds, U.S. fixed income, U.S. equities, non-U.S. equities, real estate, negative 11 to negative 22% returns. Silver outperformed all these other things and gold. And that's why in January, when these numbers came out, you saw a lot of institutional and high net worth individuals buying gold and silver. They said, wow, okay, you know, flat is not bad. Flat is not great, but it sure beats negative 11 or negative 22%. Now, the problem is that we're actually measuring individual assets against indices. So they're very volatile compared to this. Yeah, you know, you're looking at an asset versus 30 uh, stocks or 500 stocks or a thousand stocks. So you you will see greater volatility in silver and gold. But what you find is that 30% of the time from 2001 to 2021, gold or silver was the top performer. Another 20% they, they were in second, another 20% they were third. They have done very well compared to other assets over time. And yet, Negative point one. How do you invest in silver and gold? Physicals, futures, forwards, options, change traded products, managed accounts, structured notes, mining it, equities and indices. They all make sense in different ways. These are our recommend uh, buy and sell recommendations since December of 1980. From 1980 until 2000, 2001, we were basically telling people don't buy silver from a one to three year perspective, uh, sell it. Uh, in 19, in 2000, we said buy it. Uh, we were about five or six years early, but then the price rose. In April of 2011, we said sell it. Uh, and then we said buy it back in, in 2019. Pretty good. And it sets up really well when you say, well, what did our competitors as advisors to people for free uh, advice on on buying silver. And they were like, well, I started in 80 or I started in 2000 or I started in 2021 or I started in 2013. And I said, buy silver because it's going to $100 an ounce. And they've been long and wrong, substantial parts of their lives. You gotta pay attention to it. If you buy and hold silver, you may do well. If you 
buy it and then in times when the price gets high you sell it and you put your money into a treasury bond you'll do a heck of a lot better that's the long no shorting and if you buy it and sell it buy low and sell high as lenin said um you can do very well this is an eight-year principal protected loan you buy you can have it as a managed account. You can have it as a note. Basically, what you're doing is you're buying elongated options, and you are guaranteeing that if you put the other money into a treasury bill, and over an eight-year period, the money you invest in the treasury is worth 100% of your initial investment. If the price of silver falls, you still have your metal and your money. If the price of silver rises, you get almost 100% of the price increase. Principal protected. Managed accounts are cheaper to create, faster to create than a protected note because a note has a lot of legal issues attached to it. This is what that one was. We priced it in this, uh, February 9th. Uh, the price at the time was $22.12. The futures price, eight years out, was... Uh, or seven years out, was um, $25. And that was the, the theme. Now, fantasy. Will they ever release silver and let the true market value dictate? Why do bankers use it to cover? I'm not sure what they, that means, but let's deal with the first part. I'm not sure who they are. Uh, the question reminds me of that song, please release me, let me go. You don't want my loving anymore. No one is holding the price of silver down. The price of silver is very volatile. It's set by an international market where tens of thousands, if not millions of people are buying and selling on a daily basis. No one has a vested interest in lower prices other than silver fabricators and they don't really have any market power to speak of. Uh, so I don't think they will ever release silver because they're not holding it. And I think the true market value is available on your screen every day because that's what the market is. Anybody who tells you that the true market value price is something other than you can get don't listen to that person. The government may seize your silver someday, or your gold, or both. No, silver and gold are inconsequential to every government in the world. In the 1930s, gold represented maybe a third of the world's financial wealth. And in the midst of the Depression, people were taking money out of their banks. They weren't investing they weren't making that money available for loans. They were putting it in gold. And the depression got worse and worse because a third of the world's wealth was tied up in gold. And the U.S. government said, turn in your gold. And 40 million ounces was turned in even before they issued the executive order saying, turn in your gold. Executive order was voluntarily voluntary uh people turned in 40 million ounces before it was issued they turned in another 4 million ounces or 5 million ounces in the following year and beyond they kept something like 12 or 13 million ounces which they were allowed to you could hold two gold coins 20 dollar gold pieces of uh, one ounce each you could hold two coins of each vintage that the U.S. had, which I think were from the 1870s until 1932, 33. So you could hold a substantial portion of, of gold legally. No one ever went through safety deposit boxes, homes, safes, offices, or anyplace else. There was one guy who challenged the Treasury uh, uh, edict, so they prosecuted him, that I want to be a mortar. He said, okay. Yeah, we kind of like, we'll help you. Uh, no one else was prosecuted. There was no G-men going to safety deposit boxes. And gold was 33% of the uh, financial, world's financial. Now it's like 0.4%. Uh, 
gold is totally inconsequential. You know what's really stupid? When somebody tells you that the government is suppressing silver and gold prices because they don't want people to worry about inflation. As if any, as if a majority of Americans know what the gold or silver prices are. They don't know. They know that eggs are eight dollars a dozen, where they used to be three and a half dollars. They know what oil, uh, gasoline prices are. They know what their fuel oil is for their heating bill. They know what that guy is cost charging him, you them to take them to the airport in a in a taxi or an Uber or a Lyft compared to what it was a year ago. They know what inflation is. And to suppress the silver price so people aren't worried about inflation, that's like the dumbest thing you could think. You know, it should, I'm sorry. I like questions. I like good questions. But that is one of those things that says, well, I mean, I think if you ask American, what's the price of silver? You will find less than 1% of adult Americans who can tell you a price, what the price of silver is within 10% of what it is. You're not going to convince them that inflation is down because you're suppressing the silver price. You're going to com convince them that inflation is down by lowering the prices of goods and services that they're buying, which is a hell of a lot harder to do. Just, if, just like, boom, take a walk, get some fresh air, think this one through. I know, I know, a true believer would find it heretical to change their opinion based on observable evidence and their own experience. But take a walk and think about it. Are electronic companies suppressing prices? No. As I said earlier, manufacturers uh, that use silver, they uh, tend to use silver uh, jewelry and silverware. It's a high uh, silver con uh, value content product, but everything else, especially electronics, you know, they, the value of uh, the <clears throat> Silver in an electronic component is minuscule compared to the value of that component or that piece of electronic equipment. They don't care. Yeah, you know, in 1979, when the price of silver was rising toward $50 an ounce, I was having a filling done by my dentist, who I still use. And I asked him if the price of silver's increase was affecting the charge that he was making for doing fillings. And he just started laughing hysterically. He said, Jeff, Jeff, the price of silver at $5 or $50 is so inconsequential to what I'm charging for this filling that I'm laughing. Manufacturers are not suppressing the price of silver. Silver market manipulation, we've gone through this in recent videos. Probably make it quick. Uh, there is spoofing, as there is in virtually every market, including buying a used car off of a lot in the suburbs. Uh, there are no indications of large, broad conspiracies. There's a guy who was accused by the CFTC of trying to, to manipulate the, the frozen and concentrated orange juice market in the mid-1980s using uh, client funds that he was not authorized to use to put together and try to squeeze the orange juice market. And he said to the CFTC, be lenient with me and I'll tell you what Drexel Burnham is doing in the silver market. They investigated Drexel. They found two matched trades, which were illegal at the time, and fined them, I think, $600,000. And then they banned him from life. He needed a job. So the next thing you know, he's going around the world telling people, that there's this massive short position that Drexel Burnham has and it's going to blow up in their face and the price of silver is going to go to $50. Drexel goes bankrupt for other reasons. So he says, no, 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 it's Merrill Lynch. Merrill gets out of the metals business, so he says, it's J.P. Morgan. And it's been since the 1980s and that short position is a hedge of a physical long position and it has never blown up in anybody's face and according to him, there would have been three or four banks and hundreds of traders involved in this, and no one's ever come forth and said, yeah, that's what we do. And the price has them blown up. You want to believe that in the face of all evidence, observable evidence, and your own personal experience, I can't help you. 
Do we accept the U.S. government and be able to save Sri Lanka? No, because it doesn't happen. So you don't have to accept it. What you have to do is get yourself some good research and some good advice and get that conspiracy junk out of your head so you can think straight, understand what's really going on. If you want to see a manipulated market, look at the oil price from 2005 to 2007 when it rose steadily in a small channel because OPEC realized that Sheikh Yamani had been right in the 1980s and that if you raised the oil price slowly but steadily and you did it in such a way that you didn't have gas lines in the United States and Europe, people would accept a much higher price. And the price of oil went from $10 a barrel to $140 a barrel before anybody sort of said, hey, wait a second, this water's boiling. Is there a silver barter exchange that we know of? No, I don't know of any. People barter silver. I mean, one of the greatest stories of silver, which I love to tell, is my family is big on gold, gold and silver. My parents owned gold and silver. My father had a treasury license by virtue of what he did uh, as a profession that allowed him to own gold uh, professionally, uh, even prior to 1975, when private gold ownership was reallowed in the United States. They owned gold and silver, and their relatives did. And I had an uncle who bought a lot of that silver coinage that we were talking about earlier. at a dollar, a dollar twenty-nine an ounce. And he held it. That was in the early 1960s. And in 1980, when the price of silver went to $50 an ounce for a minute, uh, and uh, I think that month, January of 1980, the average price was like $35 an ounce, he bought a house, and the guy agreed to pay it to take his silver at $35 an ounce. Now, it took about three months to close, by which time the price of silver was $16 an ounce. But the guy honored his, 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 his promise, and he took that silver at $35 an ounce, and my uncle got that house. Now, the guy took it at $35 an ounce, even though the price on the market was $16 an ounce. Um, but that's a true market value time of, of the silver because he was convinced that it would go back to 50 any any moment. And that was 1980 and 2011. It did go back to 50 briefly. Um, in April of 19, uh, 2011. My uncle, meanwhile, started buying silver again. That was a barter. It wasn't on an, a formal exchange. I don't know of any real formal barter exchanges uh, for silver. Can't really help you. A few more charts. Falling COMEX inventories do not cause the price to rise. These are falling inventories in the 90s. These are falling inventories now. Much smaller decline than there was back then. You look at it, it's what really matters is the relationship between the deliveries and open interest. The very few deliveries are made relative to open interest. Uh, if you look at the price of silver and market monthly inventories, these are total inventories. Big decline in the inventories, 1990s, and the silver price is flatlining. Okay. Start to see increasing inventories, and the price of silver rises. Inventories rise further, silver prices rise further. If you want to see higher prices, and you think that COMEX inventories matter, then you would want to see a higher inventory, not lower inventory. And then if you say, well, no, it's registered inventories, it's even more dramatic because you had registered inventories rise sharply and then fall, rise sharply and then fall, and the silver price dead flat line. And then you had inventories rise sharply and the price rose sharply. And then inventories did fall and the price rose, but inventories rose again and the price continued to fall. Inventories fell and the price continued to fall. Inventories rose and the price went sideways. Inventories rose further and the price rose short. The relationship between COMEX registered or total inventories and silver prices is not relevant. If you think that you can drive the price of silver high, 
by draining COMEX inventories. Take that walk in the fresh air. That's what I have. I don't know if Carlos has more questions. We've already gone almost two hours, so we probably want to wrap it up. Our yearbook uh, for gold will come out late March. Our yearbook for silver will come out for in late April. They have a lot of the charts that you saw here. You might have noticed they were through 2021. That's because they were from our 2022 yearbook. If you really want to understand gold and silver and platinum group metals, best place to start is buying our yearbooks and then going to our website. There's a lot of free reads. There are free videos. There's all kinds of information that will help you on the free, on the free side of the paywall. And then there's a lot of stuff on the pay side of the paywall. Carlos, any key questions you want to throw out? Uh, you spoke, uh, you touched on many of the questions that were asked, but there is one question here. Uh, how long, uh, how low can the silver price drop if there is a global market crash? The all-in sustaining uh, cash cost is approximately $14 and perhaps a little bit higher if you include um, the exploration costs and cost of capital. Um, if the price falls to $13, is this a screaming buy for silver? If the price of silver falls to 13, yeah. The standard CPI, I mean, first off, the all-in sustaining cost is not the key variable to look at, although it is a important variable. But again, you're talking about 20% of total mine supply in a world that has 5 billion ounces in refined form that can compensate for the 200 million ounces of primary silver mine production each year. But um, our standard answer is like, if the price of fall, silver falls to $13, call us. It may be a great time to buy, or it may not be. It depends on why the price fell to $13 and where we are as a world at $13. I do know that when the price of silver was $13 a few years ago, CPM group issued a buy recommendation. Um, maybe it wasn't quite $13. Maybe it was $15. I would think that from what we know today, where we are today as a world, economically, politically, financial markets, socially, paucity of education, um, I would say that from where we are today, our view is that you won't see $13. And if you did, it's probably a strong buy recommendation. But I would say this, if you see $13, check in with us because it all depends why price is $13, why it's dropped from $21 today to $13 whenever and what's going on. It may well be that $13 is a way station on the way to lower prices. Uh, it's hard to say. So, but the all in sustainable cost of 20% of production is uh, not the key variable to look at in determining whether a price is high or low in terms of its future trends. Anything else? I think that's it for the moment. You've touched on many of the other questions here. All right. Thank you. Two hours, fun-filled information. We will be posting this probably tomorrow on our YouTube channel, so it'll be reviewable, and you can send it to your crazy uncle and say, hey, Leo, Take a look at this. Um, and um, we hope to see you around. If not before then, next year when we do Silver Facts and Fantasies for Take Care. <laughs>